All right. In this video, we're going to look at just a couple of ways you might go about uh, creating an object in Gorbato and uh, bringing it into Modo for further modeling. Uh, I emphasize just a couple of techniques because there are a broad range of uh, ways you can go about this, but I picked a couple of things that are unique in nature and I thought would be interesting to, to show you. Uh, we're going to start with a very basic shape when you see uh, rotating there. A basic shape created in Grobato and uh, turn it into something uh, quite uh, complex and elegant uh, like the Moto model you see there on the right. A couple little things I'm going to set up. I'm not going to get into all the basics of Grobato modeling here. That's covered in uh, other videos that we have online. But I lock the lights to the camera. That's always one of the first things you want to do when modeling so you never get stuck on the dark side. I'm using the command key to rotate the model, the shift, I mean, uh, the space bar to pan, and, uh, and the L key to uh, zoom in and zoom out on targets, which uh, always, only works if you have the uh, level camera option on. All these keys are covered uh, by simply hitting the question mark key and bringing up a list of keys. Um, but those are really all the, all the keys you need to know when modeling. Uh, it's actually a very simple and effective modeling camera. So here we see the Boolean construct, and as you can obviously see, this model is made out of three cones. Well, maybe it's not so obvious, uh, but that's the trick here. That's uh, one of the little areas I wanted to cover in this video. Um, you see there, as I'm rolling over, there are indeed three cones, uh, and they're being intersected with a single ellipsoid. And because there are these three cones intersecting the single ellipsoid, um, they intersect inside the body of that ellipsoid and create these interesting boundaries and curves between them. And that's what we're taking advantage of. That's a little trick that we're using to set up for some nice modeling in Moto. And as you see me going through here and selecting these uh, various cones, you can begin to see their actual shape inside the ellipsoid there. And you can see why those boundaries exist, those lines in between them, because that's where their intersection and the uh, surface of the ellipsoid uh, meet. All this becomes a little clearer if we just start uh, messing with the, uh, with the cones. Let me uh, turn down the uh, wireframe weight there so you can see it a little more clearly. Now as I'm simply scaling uh, the upper radius of all those cones together, just turn the mouse resolution down to a little bit finer, um, or doing anything, rotating, translating, whatever. If you watch closely, you can see the outline of the cone changing as well as those seam intersections. And you see in a little inset there uh, what the result of this is going to be once we mesh it. We're going to get typical Grobato uh, edge loops, seam rows, that follow these edges. And you can really create uh, any kind of useful, interesting, uh, surprising, wonderful set of edge loops to play with in Moto, and we'll be using a simple script in Moto uh, along with these edge loops and the patches that they uh, define to do some wonderfully effective modeling in Moto. And when you set up this sort of thing, there's no reason why the cones in this case or whatever uh, primitive you're using have to fill that volume. Here's an interesting variant where I trimmed the cones down a little bit and it gave me this kind of nice flat nose and this little uh, chunk taken out of the side. Now I could definitely see working with that geometry in Moto as well with those extra details, but we're just going to go back to this uh, very simple form and use that as our starting point in Moto. I use the mesh generated by it. So let's get ready to export here and there's a couple of things that we're going to want to uh, keep in mind. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of the export options and the seam settings and that sort of thing. Uh, those are covered perfectly well in other videos. In fact, I just recently did a video that talks about uh, density control in some detail, and you might want to check that out. Um, but here we've got a fairly high density. Um, that's partly because we based it on a large object. You can see from that base key on selected object button. Uh, moderate width, four seam rows, all the settings are kind of standard. Uh, we hit the preview button and uh, we see what we get. I'm going to turn up this uh, 
seam highlighter so we can see the seams very clearly. And there you can see we've got four row seams, four rows on either side of the center line. Uh, they're rounded a bit. Um, they're not terribly wide, but wide enough to kind of give some interesting variation in uh, their width. There's the center line that separates patches right there. You can always tell when it goes through a corner like that. Uh, the quads come together in a, in a star-like form whenever there's a corner. And you can also see some of the uh, little quirks that we're working to clean up uh, uh, in the Grobato mesh. You get these little triangles of fans whenever the uh, curvature gets tight around these seams, as you can see in, in these areas. And that's why you don't want to push the density low. I know it's uh, yeah, a lot of times uh, you guys are used to working with much lower density meshes, but remember you're getting a lot more of the morphology, a lot more of the geometry defined in this phase of modeling when you use Grobato. So you don't need to worry about having ultra low density meshes. Now we are addressing that. Uh, we're going to have our variable density meshes soon, so you won't be spending uh, polygons where you don't need them. But uh, I would suggest, you know, shooting for something about like this. You notice the density is low back here, but I'm not even going to worry about that because I know that area is not going to see any really uh, severe modeling, and the seams are certainly dense enough to handle the things that I want to do back in that area. Uh, but everything else, you know, it's kind of low density underneath here on the underside, but again, I don't plan on doing much down there, so that's fine. Uh, but an important thing to note here is that the density is, uh, can be adjusted on a per object basis, as again is covered in that video I did recently. And that can be very important when working with Booleans because the trim surface is often the object that sets the quad size, that sets the density. Here we see this second ellipsoid, which creates the flat sides of this model. And with its default settings, with, with the automatic settings that Grobato had, its density was really a little too low. So I went in here and used the uh, override option, again covered in that other video, to set it just a bit higher to get more consistent quad sizes because I am going to be modeling that area I think fairly significantly. And uh, you can see here if we generate the mesh, uh, when I turned it back down to the settings that uh, the that would have been generated automatically, they're just a little large. They're not bad, but they really affect those areas I pointed out earlier with tight curvature up there near the front. You get even more severe fans. So, you can go ahead and crank that up. Now I could go, you know, even considerably higher, like I'm going to do here, and generate the mesh again. And uh, now they're even a little bit smaller than uh, some of the neighboring quads. But, I'll go back to, ultimately go back, well, let's see, I'm going to try it even, uh, even higher still. There we go. Now we can, now we can clearly see. Um, and that definitely cleaned up those corners up in the front, but I don't, I don't feel that that's really necessary for, uh, for this model, so I'm going to go back to about where I had it, somewhere in the 160 something range. But remember, sometimes it's the trim surface, not the, uh, not the original surface that uh, is uh, creating parts of your model and you may want to go in there and quite often trim services can be very, you know the trim primitives can be very large which means they uh, naturally have larger polygons so you want to watch for that kind of thing and you also want to watch for small little loops like this uh, these wingtip details which you may want to be nice and clean when you start to model them in Moto just make sure you've got some native grid what we call native grid the grid that comes from the primitive surface uh, showing up there in some relatively um, tame polygons uh, where it meets the seam. So all that's left to do now is uh, export. We uh, are grouping by patch with our export using standard UVs. Uh, everything else is set, so just go ahead and hit the export button and uh, off to Moto. All right, so here we are in Moto with our simple little spaceship model, and we're going to set out to uh, make it more interesting by taking advantage of the stuff that comes with it when we imported it from Roboto. One of the things that comes with it is a perfect set of normals, but we're going to throw those away because, as you guys probably know, um, they're of little use once you start modifying the surfaces. They're going to be uh, discarded by this first script that we run, which is one of the scripts that uh, will come with this video. Uh, you guys will actually access it through the 
run script menu. It'll have the same name, but it just won't be there in your tool palette in the model like you see it here. But uh, the first one is the model prep. It asks for the number of seam rows, and it asks if you want to uh, activate Catmill ROM or a Pixar style subdivision uh, for this model. And those two things are related. Um, the row thing just creates a, a couple of handy selections uh, with a certain number of rows, whatever you specify from the uh, imported Grubato uh, mesh. And the uh, subdivision just kind of sets it up with the proper, uh, just a couple levels of subdivision and, and only one active um, because that's appropriate for the kind of meshes we're working with here. Uh, I'm going to take a quick look at these selections. You see one of them already. It's an edge selection and then there's an analogous um, polygon selection uh, consisting of two of the seam rows simply because that's the number I entered. There are actually four seam rows here. Uh, the reason I chose two is just to show you this one little trick. This is actually a bit of a side trip uh, because the real modeling is not going to involve this kind of stuff at all and, and you may have seen this before but by simply using something like smooth shift with that particular selection of the two center rows of the seam I can create nice ridges and beautiful little channels and again, uh, the Pixar subdivision is playing a role in how wonderfully clean uh, as well and crisp those are, as well as uh, the Grobato setup with its beautifully elegant curves. But uh, what we really want to look at is this solid patch edge script, which is the doorway to uh, really the uh, only tool I used when editing this model and moto. And uh, of course, you'll be getting it from the run script menu again from some folder on your hard drive. And what it does is it creates a selection and a weight map that allow you to uh, intelligently and uh, successfully manipulate these patches, what we call patches in Grobato, that are called parts here in Moto. And you can see on import, all of these patches were uh, created in Moto. They have the group names that they had in Grobato. And of course, you can select them over here in the list but uh, with this uh, special selection option in Moto, uh, using this materials option, in combination with this polygon tag type set to part, so again, that's the select menu, polygon tag type part. When that is the case, the materials option, selection option, automatically finds these patches just by rolling the mouse over. So you can click, and we're going to select this um, simple patch here on top because it'll be real easy to see what's going on. And uh, you will recognize this from the Grobato model. And uh, here's the seam, the seam rows, four of them on either side of the center line that separates patches. And I'm running along that center line, one side of it right there. So we'll, uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, select that, which we, which we actually already have, and run this script. And the script will, as I say, create both a uh, weight map and uh, a, a simple selection, a selection of the polygons and points of this patch. It has a couple of different flavors um, based on the number of rows. Since we have four rows, we're going to use one of the four row flavors, ease in and out. So I go ahead and select that and you see a patch was created over there in the list. I'm also telling the script that I want it to use the uh, weight map that was created as our fall off. So again, um, new patch was, uh, a new weight map was created, uh, fall off was activated, and uh, we naturally can take a look at that by turning on vertex map. And uh, it's, it's often hard to see with this red color, all the action takes place right around the seam here. Uh, the center of the patch is all solid with a weight of one. So with all that set up, uh, we're going to start modifying things, and I'm switching to uh, the vertices mode here just so we can get a nice clean look at the mesh, the shaded mesh itself while we're doing the modeling. Quick note though, after the script runs the uh, vertex selection doesn't go all the way out to the edge of the seam. Uh, the polygon selection does, uh, the vertices don't. So if you do choose like I did to switch to vertices you need to just uh, use the standard moto shift up arrow to expand that selection all the way out to the uh, center of the seam as you see here. 
So the parts of the weight map that we looked at just a second ago that were solid red will move as a solid piece, and the gradient part will uh, stretch. And that's what we see here. And because I chose that uh, ease in, ease out option in the script, we have an uneven distribution of seam rows here. That's occurring as we pull out that seam um, because of the weight of the weight map. And that gives us a kind of a nice tight turn, uh, a kind of a crisp uh, edge. And you can see again, the, the, old, the whole patch itself moves as a solid piece. Nothing outside of the uh, center line of the seam changes and nothing inside the interior of the uh, patch that we selected changes. There you can see the gradient of the weight map more clearly now that we've stretched it out a bit. And uh, here's the difference. If I had chose the other option with the script, the bevel option, you would get even distribution. And that gives you a little bit more just bevel-like flat profile. So here I'm just, uh, I've sped things up because I'm just going to play around with combining our weight map with a simple linear falloff. And when you do that, you get some uh, really nice, interesting, and uh, wonderful things to happen. And this was really it. This is the method I used for just about 99% of modeling on this little project. And uh, it's a really simple, fun, and easy way to go. So here's the model a little further along uh, after just lots of uh, fiddling around and playing with the, the, that same trick of using the script provided and manipulating uh, patches with uh, the falloffs that it creates, the vertex maps and the selections. Now, of course, sometimes you want to move a whole chunk of the model, and that's fine, too. The script will work with that just as well. There, I've used the lasso tool, and I still am using that uh, select by material uh, set to a uh, part. And I just had to go over there and uh, shift click to catch a couple little patches, a couple little parts that were not included in the lasso. But now I've got a nice big solid chunk, big solid selection that includes many parts, many patches. And uh, I can run the same script on it, get the same nice uh, soft beveled or, or ease in, ease out edge, and uh, then manipulate that thing as a whole. So again, there it is all set up. I've sped things up. You've already seen the steps to the script, so we're just going to skip over those. There's the weight map that it created. And uh, just off again with uh, some standard tools. Once again, it's, in this case, it's simply a combination of a simple linear falloff. And uh, the weight map is in effect. You'll notice there's a whole bunch of weight maps that have piled up over there in the lists on the right from, from running that script several times. And you can always go back and reuse them. Uh, but with something very simple like that and a couple of quick moves with a very general tool like translate, scale, rotate, you can uh, pretty dramatically change the character of the ship, which was kind of a, a little homely and blunt looking, and now uh, has a nicer, uh, more elegant line to it. So there you have it, uh, perhaps a bit ironic uh, that we use such a simple form since one of Roboto's strengths is uh, its ability to handle complex morphologies. Um, but uh, here are a few notes on things that I did uh, later on to tweak the model a little bit, just little things here and there, but frankly we know you guys have a lot more tricks up your collective sleeves than uh, we could ever imagine. So we can't wait to see uh, what you guys do when you get your hands on these uh, tools and scripts and uh, Grobato itself. And uh, we're sure you'll uh, have fun and uh, create some wonderful stuff.